for the people on Zoom to know that the room is actually full with thousands of people inside. They cannot get into the room. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Bert, and I, I, I am the lucky one who will do this introduction today for the tutorial called Fine Correspondences and Their Applications. Um, no, the button doesn't work, so let me... No. Now it works. So actually, there will be four presenters today. Uh, Levante Hyder will show you two view and multi view problems. He, he is from Hungary, from Utrecht Loran University. Uh, James Spritz will show you single view problems. He's from the Czech Technical University. Then Dimitro Mishkin will tell you how you can, how you can uh, detect and match um, local features using a fine correspondence and partially fine uh, correspondences. He is also from the Czech Technical University and also from Hoover. And then in the end, I will show you how to use such features in practice. And I am Daniel Barrett and from ETH Zurich. Just to give you some intuition what uh, we're going to talk about today, um, I want to show you with pictures what affine correspondences are. So basically, if we have a single image and we detect uh, local features on it, so local features mean we have a point location, we can have other information regarding the region of which that point lies. And if we try writing down, describing the shape of the region by a two times two, it's not, not an affine, but it's a linear, uh, a linear transformation, then we get basically a local affine frame and it, it, it is on one view. When we have local affine frames in two views and we do the matching procedure, so we find like point pairs and we know the shape pairs too, uh, then we have a point correspondence and we know the shape change as a two times two linear transformation in two images. This is called an affine correspondence, basically. Um, why we still call it as a fine, so a fine correspondence, even though having only a linear transformation as a two times two matrix, because the translation basically is in the point, point locations. So this is how we get the translation part of the affine transformation and the linear part is the shape basically of the, of the region on which the feature lies. Um, when having the fine correspondences, we can do we can do many many things. So nowadays uh, there are many algorithms uh, for single view geometry problems, which Jimmy will show you. Uh, we can talk about vanishing point and line estimation. We can talk about scene plane segmentation, auto calibration, finding repetitive uh, textures um, in an image. Then also we can talk about two view and multi view problems. Uh, when having two view, of course, we can we can estimate homographies. We can estimate so we can solve basically the most popular problems uh, for for two view and multi view uh, from a fine correspondence. We uh, uh, fine correspondences. We have solvers for most of them. So like surface normal, multi plane segmentation, relative pose estimation. That includes for, uh, fundamental matrix and essential matrix. Or we can have multi, uh, multi view problems. For, for example, multi view optimal surface normal estimation. Uh, we can estimate generalized pose from a, for a camera rig. And also, we can use the fine features, and they are really are used in, in, um, in detecting and matching local, local features. And Dimitri will show you how these things are, uh, are done in practice. Some application. I wanted in the, in the introduction. I wanted to show you mostly uh, pictures and nice, colorful things, so you all start enjoying having uh, fine correspondences. Of course, in the next slides, uh, next presentations, they will often be dominated by equations. Sorry for that. Uh, but first, I wanted to show you some, some nice pictures. So basically, what we can do from a fine correspondence is uh, we can go for reconstruction. We can go for visual localization, too. So for example, in the left image, I hope my cursor, my cursor is visible, right? I see it moving. So for example, in visual localization, we have a known map of the environment, and we want to localize a new image or image. Ah, it went forward. And we want to localize a new image. And what we can do? In the map, we can easily calculate or easily estimate normals for each point. So we have an oriented point cloud in the map, for example, using the neighboring 3D points or something like that. And then using that normal and affine features in, the, in, in two images, in a query image and in a reference image, uh, we can estimate the absolute pose of the, of the image given a single affine correspondence. So this is usually the nice thing about you. I will show you some more motivation about this, but this is usually the nice thing about affine correspondences that we need much fewer correspondences to estimate some geometric model than by using simply points. 
of course, it has a dark side too. We will, we will, uh, we will cover that slightly later. Also, we can do oriented point cloud reconstruction. So what happens in this case, we can detect uh, feature affine correspondences in image pairs or tracks of affine features in, uh, in multiple views. And then we can, for each um, correspondence independently, we can estimate an or, uh, uh, a surface normal. And then here you can see this is one image from the uh, sequence which is used. Again, these are one, uh, the first images from the sequences. And then you can see the reconstructed point cloud um, and these blue rods, I'm not sure how visible they are actually, but those are the estimated normals, uh, point-wise, correspondence-wise normals, so there is no polishing on top of them. Also, this is another example on the right where we have some bone structure reconstructed, and again, we can go for oriented point cloud reconstruction. So we can use affine correspondences, for example, for this problem. Also, we can go for a slam simultaneous localization and mapping. So we have solvers for generalized um, camera, uh, camera pose estimation in it. When we have a, a vehicle mount, um, um, a sensor camera system mounted to a moving vehicle, we can estimate the pose of the vehicle from actually two affine correspondences in contrast to the, uh, the six-point method, uh, in contrast to the six-point methods. Also, another colorful slide so we can go for plane segmentation we can we can do it even by detecting multiple homographies using affine correspondences these actually the images here are the first image of, of, of image pairs and the top row is the segmented point cloud so basically the color denotes the plane in these images so we can go for multiple homography estimation uh, and then do the segment and then do the reconstruction and also we can go for oriented point cloud reconstruction and then do the segmentation using the, uh, the point normals, basically. Another application, this is a single view problem. Uh, we can try finding um, uh, image planes when, when we have repetitive uh, uh, texture in the, in the image. So for example, the ground here is repetitive. And if you look around, here also in this room, the ground tends to be rep tends to have repetitive uh, texture on it. Even we have ties now here, the walls are also repetitive textures. Uh, so in man-made environment, such textures happen quite often, and we can use this information in order to, from a single image, get the plane. And this is the imaged vanishing line here um, in uh, in orange, and here on uh, in green. Um, and these are detected from, from a single affine correspondence in an image, considering that we have repetitive texture. Um, and this, this, when having the image plane found, we can actually do a lot of things. For example, we can do gravity detection. So of course, if we know where the ground is, then we can estimate the gravity direction in the images. And if we do it image-wise, this helps a lot when doing, for example, relative pose estimation between images. So you know that when we have two images and we have the gravity direction for an IMU or for example, by this method, then the relative pose estimation problem is much, much easier. We need only three point correspondences uh, compared to the compared to the five point method. Also, when we have the uh, image plane, uh, and when we have found image planes, we can use them in the next procedure to to rectify the rectify the plane basically. So we want to, in this case to uh, transform the plane, the image, as if the plane is front to parallel to the to the camera, and we can use this and for some right image here. Uh, is uh, generated by using a single affine correspondence. So basically in this case, we first found the image plane and then uh, in a hierarchical manner, uh, we rectified the images to get uh, this rectification. And that can help a lot in understanding the scene uh, around us to reduce distortion, lens distortion, whatever we have in the images. So rectification is often used in practice too. Also, we can go for symmetry detection. This is again, a single view problem. We can go for symmetry detection uh, when having repetitive uh, repetitive texture. So, for example, here is the input on the on the left. We can find different symmetric uh, rep repetitive regions, and then we can use these re these regions to to segment densely the the pattern in the image. So for example, here you can see. I have no idea how this pattern is called, but it has a name. Something. Or here, the poster wallpaper is segmented using this, uh, this method uh, with a single view. Uh, here, 
So if I go back, you see the kit cuts are not actually uh, symmetrically placed, uh, but still we can use this uh, the constraint of having repetitive, te uh, repetitive textures uh, in order to segment them. And you can see that they are quite nicely fined, and the pixels that are assigned to the uh, to the objects. We can do other things. We can do auto calibration. So in this case, we again it is done from a single image. Uh, in this case, we assume a Manhattan frame. So basically, three uh, assuming that we have three orthogonal planes. This holds in many cases when we have buildings around us. Uh, and then we go from a fine correspondences to vanishing point detection. And then from vanishing points, we can estimate. Uh, we can auto calibrate the cameras. We can uh, we can get the rotation and given that building. Uh, we can get the 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 uh, lens distortion parameters and all other kind of parameters which we which we want to estimate when when trying to auto calibrate an image. So this is another example. Um, this is feature matching. Uh, actually, people do not always realize that in feature matching, uh, basically we cannot really do anything without having some, so at least partially affine covariant features. Because what happens when doing feature detec uh, detection and matching? We have two images. We do, not jump to the next slide. We do, we use some, some feature detector, whatever, SIFT, for example, we, we use SIFT. Then the second step is we try to normalize the image patch around this, uh, the det detected point. So they look like the same in the two images. And in, in order to do that, for example, when we have C features, we have an orientation and we have a scale, we rotate the image patches. So they are oriented the same in the two images. And then and we set the sizes of the image feature, uh, of the patches. So they, the size is also the same. And then, uh, it really helps in uh, in the matching because then we extract some dis descriptors descriptors using, for example, the gradients and the image, as done in SIFT. And then without this patch normalization, uh, uh, this description doesn't really work or doesn't work as much as as it as it can when um, when doing this. Um, patch normalization. And of course, the more information we have, so if we have orientation and scale, that helps a lot. But if we have a fully fine frame, fully fine feature there, that helps in reducing the projectivity in the image, in the image patches uh, much more. What else we can do? So for example, we can, uh, we can estimate dense features. Uh, there was a page, paper about it uh, actually last year, it seems. Um, where we can basically estimate uh, local features for each pixel in the image. And then for each pixel, we do some, some dense nearest neighbor search uh, to get a flow or so to get uh, correspondences, uh, which is then used for warping the images, defining some transformation, some initial transformation between the images. So this is seen here. And then we can do some refinement to improve uh, in an iterative manner the, uh, the, the estimated uh, transformation between the images. And these were the applications which I wanted to show you. Of course, I didn't show all of them. I just wanted to show a few of them so you know that these affine correspondences are actually useful and not just sounds cool. Um, but next, I want to discuss with you some, some benefits, some properties of, uh, of these affine correspondences. For example, the thing which we, we like and why we use affine correspondences is uh, because they lead to some kind of covariance uh, given the image transformation. So for example, here you can see the original image. This is the cat here, right? So we then detect some features that affine shape of the region. And that is the head of the cat basically. And we expect the fine covariant feature detector to find the same region, the same feature, the same uh, region shape basically after we warp the image by some fine transformation. So for example, here, here we warp the image a cat like this, and then we do uh, apply again the same feature detector and we expect to, find, to, to uh, really figure out the shape of the, of the transformed region. Um, what we call repeatable and non-repeatable uh, feature. Um, so basically there are two examples here. 
First one is, of course, the ground shear transformation of the, of the feature of what we have. The second one is a repeatable feature. How we measure repeatability, basically it means that how much are we able to find to figure out the, the, the imaging transformation when detecting the features. So for example, it kind of measures, this is the Jacquard distance between the ellipses, that is the repeatability, but this basically measures the intersection of a union uh, given, the, given the ellipses. And if it is kind of similar, then we call it repeatable if the found feature is much, much different than uh, what we want to find at that point, uh, then we call it not repeatable. Um, why this is uh, useful and um, how can we use this? So for example, if in this case, we have again, a single image and we want to find a repeated pattern in the image. What can we do? We can do some affine covariant feature detection. We find features here. So these are the features, the points there. If we find the fine shape well, accurately enough, then we can use it to normalize the patches around the features like this. So for example, this T here are the green dots in the left image. And if we use the fine information, we can normalize them. So they look the same in the, in the, in the cropped patches. Why it's good? Because then we do some cl clustering on top or whatever, and then we can find the repeated pattern. So basically the patches which look the same in the same image will be the repeated pattern and will be assigned to the same, same class, same label or whatever we call it. So we want to be basically, um, when talking about, talking about uh, features, uh, they will be covariant to the orientation scale and the fine transformations. So this means that we'll, they will give us basically the orientation scale and, and the fine transformation. But we want to use this covariance to make the image patches invariant to these, the, to these transformations by, by normalizing them basically. So these are images from the age patches data set, uh, the old image sequence. From left to right, there's a gradually increasing uh, a viewing angle given the, given the image plane. Uh, what you can see here, um, basically there are ground through transformations and there are detected ground transformations. The ground through ones are the red ones. I'm not sure how visible they actually are. Not that important at this point, but what happens, what happened here? So basically we detected the features, we cut out the patches around and we normalized and this is done here in the second row. So for each column here is a normalized feature in the five, the same normalized feature in the five images. So for example, the first cell here belongs to one of, yeah, one of the features in the first image, the second, cell, second row belongs one of the features in the second image, etc. And the thing which you can see here that the first the fine uh, correspondences in the first two rows, in the first rows are kind of good. What indicates this? These patches, these normalized patches look very similar. Why it's good? Because then it's easy to match them, easy to find the pairs in the, in the, in the images uh, because we can use the fine information to, to, to reduce the effect coming from the viewpoint change from whatever change we have. While in the second part of the, in the bottom part of this uh, figure, you can see again different kind of different features in the image, same image sequence. But the thing which you can see that it is, it is, it should not, and by the way, it should not be bad, but not repeatable, and the top should be repeatable, just to keep the keep the terminology what we used before. And the thing which you can see here that the columns are not too similar. I mean, I mean the rows in the columns are not too similar because they are, and this simulates like inaccurate noisy fine transformations which are not good enough to uh to uh, to to normalize the patches in a way that they are uh, they can be found in multiple images and you can see if you go from bottom to top um sorry from top to bottom that means from left to right in the sequence and you can see that the bigger the viewpoint change is so we are more to the right the less likely that the normalized patch looks like as in the first color, first row is it understandable? I'm not sure if I told it in an understandable way. But when, by the way, whenever you have any questions, something is not understandable, I want you to raise your hand and ask it again. I'm happy to tell everything twice, three times, even four times if needed. 
uh, but I want you to understand the concepts. I want you to understand what really happens in this uh, in the slides. So it's understandable, right? Good. Um, some examples of what kind of covariance we can have when having features. So of course, the minimal one is, I would say, the translational covariance, which means that actually we found the feature location in two images. That is what we have. That is Harry, uh, the Harris detector, Hessian det detector, super point. And here you can see this. So this is the original image in the top row. And being able to find the center, the, the same, uh, same point, same feature point in two images means that we can cut out the window centered on the, for example, the middle of the eye. I should have put a point there in the, in the middle of the eye, but I guess you can imagine a dot put, uh, put there. So basically this is a minimal thing which we want from a, from a feature detector, being able to find feature points. Then what else can we have? Uh, we can have rotation covariant features and also scale covariant features. I usually they come together, for example, in SIFT, it is a uh, rotation and scale covariant. In ORB, it is kind of both, but people usually use just the orientation. Uh, but what happens if we have such, such uh, additional covariances? Basically, we can use this rotation to rotate the images, image patches, so they are oriented the same in the two images. So this is this row here. We can use the scale to scale up the images to have the same size in the two images. And now you see that this eye became bigger, so it, it is as big as in the first image. Of course, there is still some effect, uh, some projectivity there happening, but now the orientation and the size is good. Of course, then we can have affine covariant features, which will give us a full affine transformation here. Uh, we can have different ones. We can ha have handcrafted detectors, uh, Hessian affine, MSCR. We can have learned detectors, for example, FNET. We can have simulation-based detectors, like using some view synthesis to warp the images with some by some artificial affine, affine transformations and then find the features. There are lots of different kinds of approaches to find affine features. Most of them will be covered, hopefully, by Dimitro, so you will get to know more about this at that time. Also, we can have some upgrade region update based detector. So we have a region. Ah, there was a question, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so but to have to this, um, what is the uh, true, it, de it depends. And I will, so Dimitri will tell exactly how to do the detection and which things are good. And in the last talk, I will tell which are the most accurate ones. So there is some, some, some drum in the background and you will hear by the end of this tutorial what to use in practice and how to use them in practice. So I will answer this. Okay, can I ask one of you if there is some question, just take the microphone there, maybe without the, I don't know. So you can go around like Freddie Mercury with the, with the microphone on your shoulders. Okay, so let me continue. Um, so the last row here is when we have a fine correspondence. As you can see that we can reduce the perspectivity uh, as much as it's possible from a fine correspondence, basically. Just quickly, so we don't have many slides left from the introduction. Uh, so don't worry, now the equations will come, don't worry. Um, but how, how usually we represent fine transformations when, when it is drawn to images. So you might have seen images with circles, with oriented circles, whatever, uh, when, so for example, if, even if I go back in the beginning of the, of the presentation, you saw these with these oriented ellipses. And when representing the fine features or rotating, uh, rotation invariant features, et cetera, in images, we often use this representation, if I manage to go back. If we have rotation invariant feature, we use an oriented uh, circle. If we have a uh, scale and orientation invariant feature, we use an ellipse. You can see that here the main axis coincide with the, with the, with the dominant axis of the ellipse. And then having a fine cor a correspondence, so that basically the difference between having orientation and scale covariant correspondence uh, features is that we have the shear parameter, shear parameter when having a fine features. And that is usually uh, drawn as oriented ellipses. You can see that in this case, the main axis do not coincide with the dominant axis of the ellipse. This is how we represent shear in images. 
But this is basically just how we draw on images, just so you, when you see a picture with a fine correspondences on it, you will immediately know what you see by just knowing that this reasonably simple explanation. Um, what are the benefits, the main benefits when using the fine correspondences? I, I think uh, that is reasonably important. So the, as I told you in the beginning, when have the fine correspondences, of course, have more information about the scene geometry than simply point correspondences. So don't, don't just have a point location, it has some, has some transformation between the image patches, basically. So it gives more information, more equations when estimating something. And this means in practice that we need fewer correspondences when estimating some geometric model, homography, relative pose, whatever we currently estimate. We need fewer correspondences than by using point correspondences. Why it's important? So basically, uh, RANSAC like robust estimators, uh, probably all of you, you know what RANSAC is, but RANSAC like robust estimators do minimal sampling, randomized minimal sampling, maybe with some guided sampler, but doesn't matter at this point. So they do randomized minimal sampling where they select in each iteration, in the beginning of each iteration, a minimal sample, which consists of M data points, where M is basically the number, how many samples, how many correspondences we need for the estimation. And the RANSEC iteration number and thus the processing time depends on that number and it depends on it, not exponential polynomially. So here an example in the table, actually this plot is the same as the table, but it looks like better that we have a plot there and also a table there. What you can see here, for example, when doing essential matrix estimation, we can estimate essential matrix and matrices from five point correspondences by the well-known five point algorithm. But actually we can estimate essential matrices from two fine correspondences. And if you have a look on this table, so what you see, each column is a outlier ratio. And this is basically the adaptive ransack tabulation criterion output. If we have 95 percentage outliers, it sometimes happens. Then when you're using a fine correspondence based solvers, we need to do around 2000 iterations compared to the point based solvers where we need to do like five orders of magnitude more iterations. And this, of course, translates almost directly into the processing time, what we in theory should spend on that particular problem. Of course, usually we don't spend that many iterations, but in theory, we, we should. This is one direct thing, um, one direct benefit from the fine correspondences. But the thing is that RANSAC like robust estimators, not just processing time wise, but they really are sensitive to the complexity of the problem. What this means, if we have a very complex problem, we need to select five, seven, 10, 20 point correspondences to estimate something, then the likelihood of really finding an accurate model is much, much slower, uh, smaller than when having a smaller, uh, smaller sample size. So in RANSEC, it's really important in order to have accurate results to have as small sample as possible. Okay. Uh, I think this is the pre la one before last slide. Just how we usually approach a fine correspondences when, uh, when doing something. The first thing which we can do, and that will be often done by Jimmy in his talk when having uh, single view geometry, single view problems, um, we can convert a fine correspondences to point correspondences. In two views, it is theoretically incorrect. In one view, we can do it. What happens in this case, so for example, we have this oriented ellipses, and now you know that oriented ellipse means a fine correspondence. And we can basically introduce new correspondences where these main axes intersect the, and the ellipse. So here we have this green correspondence, this is a new one. Here we have the blue correspondence, this is a new one again. And this orange correspondence is the center of the region. That is what we had earlier. So from one affine correspondence, we could generate three point correspondences and then use point correspondence based point based methods to estimate whatever we want to estimate. Also, we can approach the problem, approach affine correspondences uh, by defining them as a partial derivative of the imaging function what this uh, given given the surface in this case basically we have we observe we assume that we observe a um, smooth surface with some surface normal in it and if fine correspondent if fine estimation is defined as the first order approximation of the imaging function if we move like infinitely small steps in 3d along the tangent plane basically at that point 
It doesn't matter, Leventer will, will tell you more about this in his talk. Also, we can approach the fine correspondences via their effects on the epipolar geometry. So basically, when having a fine correspondence, we assume that they will transform the normal of the epipolar line from the first image to the, to the second one. So here, we have this P point in the first image. We have this P1, P1 and P2 and P2 in the second image. It, has, it is on some epipolar line when knowing the epipolar geometry, and we assume that the affine transformation transformed the normal of the epipolar line to the first, to the, from the first to the second image. So it rotates it, and also we have some scale constraint there. So this was kind of the introduction. Um, next, Leventer will talk about uh, stereo and multi view problems. And then Dimitri Mishkin will talk about how to find the fine correspondences in practice, what to do with local feature, et cetera, such nice things. Then we have a lunch break. Then we will have a lunch break. Then Jimmy will talk about uh, what to do when we have single images. We have one image, we, how, to, how to find repetitive texture, how to do vanishing point detection, how to do auto calibration, whatever we want to do. And then in the last um, presentation, I will show you Basically, two things. First one, how to use partially affine covariant features. What I mean, we have SIFT, we have ORB, how to use the information which they provide, uh, rot or, uh, rotation and scale. And also, I will show you the ways how can we really make a fine correspondence based robust uh, estimation accurate. Under accurate, I mean more accurate than by using point correspondences because it's quite tricky and it's not trivial how to do it, but it's, it can be done. And this was my last slide. I think I forgot putting a uh, thank you for your attention and questions slide in it. But now, thank you for your attention. Questions? Ah, thank you. <laughs> so any questions? Yes? Uh, we are noisy. This is why you have to do lots of tricks to get a good, a good result. The thing is, what happens? You have a point that is um, in, the, in the image coordinate system, basically. Then you try finding the, uh, the transformation of the region. But the thing is that that's a local thing. So even a small noise can really have a big effect on the estimation. So even if you are almost perfect in terms of noise, that can be already too noisy when doing some estimation because of the local nature, nature of such features. So you have to do things when using a fine correspondences, like local, local optimization in RANSEC and such things in order to, to make them accurate. Can be done, but it's not real. Did I answer? I am not that sure about it. So tell me the question, tell me the question. What, did I, what didn't you understand? Yeah, yeah. OK, and this is not the perfect answer. It's not, it's not trivial, it's easy. But not trivial. So you have to do what uh, you have to know what to do to get accurate fine correspondence, accurate models from a fine correspondences. Then it's implementation wise, it's easy. Uh, people use locally optimized uh, RANSECs and such things, but that is really the, the core of getting them. Good. I answered. Okay. You don't look satisfied, and this is my problem. So, okay. But I won't satisfy you today. Okay. <laughs> but sorry, tell, tell. So you had. Yeah, but how many, in how many cases you find features on edges? I mean, a lot. Uh, I, so when you go for, of course, for depends on the detector which, we, uh, which you have. If you go for region-based detection, for example, you don't often find features in the edge. But the thing is that they are usually not that important. I mean, if you have, um, if you find a few good features, that usually is enough, and you need fewer than, than having point correspondences. So it's not a problem if you find just a few, just, I don't know, half of the features which you would find otherwise. But also you can go for, so if you don't find, don't go for a fine features directly, you can go for SIFT features. And what happens with having, when having SIFT features, um, people tend to, to simply forget about the orientation and the scale which the SIFT features have when doing the model estimation. But I see you have the same number of features, what you would use otherwise. You have SIFT features. You ju don't just use the point location, but also the orientation and the scale when estimating the, uh, the, the features. And, and of course, around the edges, the orientation and scale won't be good. But anywhere else, it will be good. Be good. And anyways, the last step is to refitting on the point coordinates, usually. So it doesn't matter if you're, 
if the if the affine correspondence is inaccurate around the edges. Are you slightly happier? Good, I'm happy. I'm happy. Other questions? Okay, you can go ahead. Why not? It's amazing that I hear, hear you verse through the microphone than when you talk without it. Okay, I'll just go back. <laughs> okay, uh, no, go, go from there. Sure. So the thing is that, uh, yeah, of course, you can match. Uh, so the thing is that you don't have information about that. You can have additional procedure for matching along the feature, uh, along the ellipse, but then that I wouldn't do. Then otherwise, uh, instead, I would go for really matching features on the region uh, silhouette, because that would make sense on the ellipse, don't really. So, it, uh, so you don't have information of which points correspond to which points on the other ellipses. You just only know the, that two um, dominant directions, basically. Yes, 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 yes. Ado, you had a question. Are you going to kind of talk through the, the times when these affine features sort of break down because the three structure and sometimes perspective change will cause, you know, form, form a very different representation of the feature and the image. Yeah, yeah. So we cover like, how, how to uh, kind of metrics to, to determine when all this falls apart. Yes, of course, there are lots of things will be done. Of course, when doing a fine correspondence, we explicitly assume a piecewise, piecewise linear, piecewise planar scene. Sure. But the thing is that in practice, um, what we usually do, you use this information only for the minimal sample models, for the hypothesis in RANSAC, and then you act as if you have no affine correspondences in many cases. So you have just the hypothesis, which comes from the fewer correspondences, and then you use only the point locations. So having this assumption that it's piecewise planar uh, does not really matter anymore uh, when, do, when doing RANSAC and, and such things. So you rely on RANSAC? Basically, yes, but as, as always. So you need some robust estimator by having real world data. You have, to, you have to get rid of the outliers. You have to find out the, the model. It's, it's just slightly more tricky when doing a fine correspondences, but it can it is done and it can be done easily. Other questions? I'm not sure what the time actually is, so let me check. Oh, we have three minutes for questions. That is amazing. That's lots of questions. Yes. Yeah. You mean we have two points and you want to upgrade them basically to have this uh, the share uh, the the scale and everything, right? Or uh, I think it usually comes from the feature detector, but uh, there are of course methods upgrading upon features. But you know what happens? For example, in SIFT, you have the orient and also most of the orientation invariant features. Basically, you do you have the patch cut out, you have the image gradients, and then you do a voting to get the image uh, feature orientation. You can do that anytime. The scale is more tricky in SIFT. It comes from the scale space. But yeah, so it depends on the method you currently are using. Uh, some things, for example, orientation can always be recovered uh, independently of what features you have. And you can do tricks. And Dimitri will cover all these tricks and all these things uh, in his talk. Yeah, Good. Other questions? I think we have time for one more question or two very short ones. Good. So, if done, oh, there's a question. I didn't hear half of the thing. I heard couple and features. Yes. In what sense? Are you mean you have correspondences? Could it be that the 
I am not sure if I understood the question. Oh, so so you, you one by one. Yes. Or the pro the problem is uh, maybe Dimitro is better to answer the, to the question. But the problem is when they so you have points far away and the and even if they are not far away. So you have these are local features. If you go for three by three, this means that you could estimate, for example, the affine transformation for these three. And they are far away from each other, so they, uh, the affine transformation will be a rough approximation of the, of, the, of the actual one coming from the projective geometry. So if you define the affine correspondence as the first order approximation of the imaging function, this means that the affine correspondence at that point is true, is correct, only infinitely close to the, to the features. Of course, few pixels are right, 10 pixels are right. But as soon as you, you go farther, then that approximation will be rougher and rougher, and then it won't really reflect the actual geometry behind, behind the, the imaging procedure. Good. So thank you for your attention. And